This is Duke University. It's four o'clock in the morning. Kaesung pushes open the door and steps outside. Saying goodbye to her coworkers, she can't help but make a joke, and then laughing, unlocks her bike. Twelve hours of sorting and folding laundry hasn't dampened her spirits. Sorting napkins, folding towels, folding sheets. Her job at the commercial laundry is one she considers good. Good for a recent immigrant to Canada like herself. Good for someone who is just learning to speak English. Good for a refugee. And good in comparison to the work she did as a girl in Tibet walking in rain or snow to fetch water that she would then carry home in heavy wooden containers. Still laughing, she says a final goodbye, and then she gets on her bike and rides home. The morning is still dark, and for most of Toronto, the day has not yet started. Kesong's is just ending. So here we are in the Trumpa scene. <laughs> What responsibility, as scholars, do we have in times of political crisis? Right now, it feels we're in the starkest period of political urgency since the Vietnam War. How do we respond? How do we act effectively? How do we do so with an awareness of both the stakes and the risks that are involved? As Edward Said argued so long ago now, actually, scholarship cannot just be about the world, but must be in the world. But what does that look like in practice? Kesong and I first met in May or June of 1994. At the time, she was living in Kathmandu, and I was a young graduate student just beginning my research in the Tibetan refugee community. My Tibetan language teacher, Tinle, uh, introduced us, thinking that Kesong and her family would be good hosts for me. And he was right. We spent that first summer talking and laughing and getting to know each other. Unbeknownst to us then, we were embarking on a relationship that would endure across countries over the decades, through births, through deaths, and through so much more. And this is not unusual in anthropology at all. Uh, anthropo anthropology is a discipline in which lives and stories and the personal and the professional are often entangled. The personal and the professional and the private and the public. Sometimes the anthropology I do is public. But what is public anthropology? I get asked this a lot. Like that. It is not anthropology with the theory taken out. I think of anthropology as a form of theoretical storytelling. We do this in our teaching, so we do it in the classroom all the time. We tell stories to make theoretical points, and we do it in our writing. We make theory through telling stories. Theory comes out of the ethnographic. It does not precede it. In 2006, I did a special issue, special double issue of the journal India Review. And for anyone who remembers these, I have an off print from my editor's introduction, and it's titled Introduction, Public Anthropologies. This is now 11 years old. But in 2006, what I said anth uh, public anthropology was, it was that it was about how to use and think anthropology as a project for addressing inequity. It was supposed to be in dialogue with real world problems. It was supposed to be accountable, socially relevant, theoretically informed, politically engaged. Eight years later in 2014, I was invited to give the keynote lecture um, to the American University's annual public anthropology conference. And so the first thing I did was dig out my old thing and say, well, what did I say before? And what updates do we need now? So from 2014, I added in, it must be in the public domain. Seems obvious, but needed to be said. It must reveal things. It must work to transform practices and structures. And public anthropology should relieve, end quote. That was how I left. In 2016, I was invited to become a founding member of the Public Anthropology Institute, and this was founded by Gina Athena Ulysse at Wesleyan University. And so along with Faye Harrison, with Paul Stoller, with Maria Vesperi, and with Melissa Rosario, uh, and our assistant here, Matilda Ostrow, we spent a week at Wesleyan last June working out what it was we thought public anthropology was, and what, why we needed an institute for it. 
what we wrote collectively. My first collective writing experience with six other people. That what we wanted to do was, was not just say, do public anthropology, but train people in how to do it. And train in specific techniques for accessible and compelling storytelling. We acknowledged that this would involve risk, vulnerability, and ethical challenges. We wrote, the worst of times call for the best responses. <laughs> we had no idea that was in June. <laughs> and we wrote that it must be rich, rigorous, and responsive. There is not only one way to be a public anthropologist. And I want to now just throw out there a long list, a laundry list of potential things one could do. Write fiction, do sound installations, make art, write poetry, do spoken word, perform, work in images, do dramatic performances or street theater, dance, write outside the discipline, write op-eds, be a talking head, be an expert witness, testify in Congress, have a TV show, as two archaeologists, Jason DeLeon and Kirk French, did on the Discovery Channel from 2011 to 2014. It's called American Treasures, so we actually do have some reality TV heroes in our own discipline, the anthropologists in the room. But what they really wanted to call the show was artifact or fiction. The question mark. All the more relevant. We are not the first to do this. Ella Cara Deloria was writing across genres almost 100 years ago, writing academic texts writing fiction, and writing a work that was actually designed for missionaries and for US government officials to teach them how to work in her community and to do so with knowledge and compassion. We can also write for popular audiences, and Margaret Mead is, is who we often think of as our first popularizer, popularizer who wrote for Red Book. She had a column for many years in Red Book. Red Book. These days we have Teen Vogue. We don't necessarily need someone to do it for them. They are doing it for all of us. My public anthropology exists mostly in three domains. Um, since 2004, I've served as an expert witness in over 100 political asylum cases in the United States and in Canada for both Nepali political asylum applicants and Tibetan ones. And this is not necessarily work you go and seek of. This is work that, that finds you. And the first time that I received the call from an attorney who said, I got your name from the Center for Asian Studies at the university, and I need someone to serve as an expert witness. And I said, well, what is that? What, what would that mean? And I thought it would be my first and only case. right? And that's now 13 years ago. So many cases later. Uh, second has been my blogging work. And I have come in the last couple years to think less of, of writing blog posts and more about thinking of writing online essays and bringing people together um, to speak collaboratively from a place of knowledge when needed. Um, in 2008, Chris Kelty, who was then one of the leading bloggers for Savage Minds, contacted me. 2008 was when Tourette, Tibet, erupted in the biggest protest that had been seen since 1959. And he sent me an email and said, Carol, we need someone to write about what's going on. And I thought, oh, okay, I've, I've, I've never written this way before, um, but I'll try. And so here's my first ever post, March 11th, 2008, the resistance is dead. Long live the resistance. Four years later, I got an email from Ann Allison and Charlie Pio addressed to myself and to Ralph Litzinger sitting here with me saying we've started a new thing at Cultural Anthropology on the online website called the Hotspot Series. We've done three so far. And given what's going on in Tibet right now, we were now in the period of self-immolations where Tibetans were killing themselves through self-immolation by pouring um, petrol over their bodies and setting themselves on fire. At the time, um, the number of Tibetans who had killed themselves was around 40. This was in 2012. Five years later, we're now over 150 individuals. So Ralph and I gathered together a, a collective of 20 scholars um, and writers and activists from around the world, Tibetans, non-Tibetans, and put this issue together. And so now publicly for the first time I get to say thank you to Anne and Charlie for that invitation. I also do public talks to the Tibetan community here in the United States and Canada, India at their invitation. And that is something that actually came out from these other works for having my scholarship online and not behind a firewall such that people could find it and read it. And most of these talks that I give to the community are videotaped, sometimes they're even streamed online, uh, live online now that we have that technology. And so a journal article, I know that, I know that they're wonderful and they're great and we all, re we all read those, um, that might be read by dozens or maybe hundreds of people within the community in which I work, they do not have access to that. But some of my talks have been viewed several thousand times 
um, by people around the world. And to me, that, actually to me, that's at the heart of my scholarship. If my scholarship is not for the Tibetan community and not just with and about them, then there's no point. From Kathmandu, Boda, and Jorpati. In Nepal, Kesong and her family now find themselves in Toronto, in Parkdale, in Etobicoke, in Canada. These are all now Tibetan places. Throughout Tibetan towns, neighborhoods, and refugee camps in India and Nepal, people know these Canadian place names. They know them, however, in a singular name, as Jameson. Jameson is a street in Parkdale, which is a neighborhood of immigrants and refugees, where people fleeing different wars and violence from around the world live side by side and where the Polish butcher shop hangs a photo of the Dalai Lama on its wall and has specifically Tibetan cuts of meat. The precarity of the neighborhood is a constant topic of conversation among my Tibetan friends there. And a young friend one day as we were having lunch at Tibet Kitchen shared her frustration kind of with the high crime rate with me saying, on TV something is always happening at King and Spencer and that's a block from my apartment. Right? It's always going down here. Kaesong, for her part, insists that Tibetans have improved the Jameson Parkdale neighborhood. It was really bad when I first got here, she says, a decade later. She and most Tibetans came to Toronto via New York. They come from New York City to Buffalo, where they stayed at a Catholic refuge center called Ca uh, Viva La Casa, which was formed in the 1980s to house Central American refugees, and now serves refugees from around the world. Um, on days that I've been there, I've counted upwards of like people from 40 different countries in this refuge center. They then go on to Canada via the border crossing at Niagara Falls and go before a judge to apply for convention refugee status and eventually for citizenship in Canada. Professor Brennan, please raise your hand right here. Do you solemnly swear that you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under pains and penalties of perjury? I do. To testify, I need to be recognized by a judge as an expert witness. I'm not going to laugh. <laughs> it often is amusing. I have to submit a CV and I have to submit a country uh, report on the political conditions in the country to which I'm testifying, which in terms of Tibet could be India, could be Nepal, could be Tibet, and for Nepalese is Nepal. The attorney from the Department of Homeland Security has the option of either accepting my credentials or of doing something called a voir dire. So if the attorney chooses to voir dire, then what happens is that attorney can then grill me and go through my CV and ask all sorts of questions, basically trying to show that I'm not actually an expert on the country that I claim to be an expert on. There's one particular DHS attorney I've come up against several times. With a sneer and disdain, in one time when I was actually appearing in person, I, I testify both over the phone because I testify in courts around the United States and in Denver, I usually, which is I'm uh, close to my home, appear in person, and said to me, do you consider yourself an activist? <laughs> he proceeded throughout the voir dire to refer to me as a self-proclaimed and so-called expert. And so I think it's time for all of us to start paying a little more attention to strategies of delegitimation, right? And strategies of dismissal, and ones that we can see um, from communist states, from state socialism, from fascist states, from authoritarian states, and work on our collective responses to them. In court, I'm called upon to explain why it is that Tibetan refugees do not have documents that judges expect to see, why they don't have birth certificates or death certificates. Well, for people who die, death certificates, or marriage certificates, or divorce certificates, or passports, or identity certificates, and so on, and so on. I'm called upon to explain how it is that police in India and Nepal sometimes beat, intimidate, and threaten Tibetans, knowing they have no legal rights in those countries. And I'm called upon to explain culture, as well as politics, to explain that most anthropological of marriage traditions, polyandry, which you all learn in your introduction to anthropology lecture which is when a woman has more than one husband, and Tibet is the country that has the highest rate of polyandry in the world, and try and translate this into a legal system that doesn't just presume monogamy, but is structured to only recognize monogamy. Or I'm asked to explain adultery, a practice not distinctly Tibetan, but that came to light for one man when his children were subject to a DNA test by the High Commission of Canada in New Delhi, and to his surprise, two of his four children turned out not to be his biological children. What is an anthropologist to do in the face of a DNA test 
kinship is no more biological in Canada than it is in Tibet. And yet for refugees, going through the family reunification process, so much rests on this one test. How do we take our anthropological explanations of family, of kinship, of relatedness, our understandings of documents and adultery and love, and turn them into ethnographic interventions in the legal domain? Part of the answer involves claiming expertise, embracing a status from which some anthropologists shirk. It involves, like all ethnography, grappling with and learning to productively sink into discomfort. It then involves acknowledging the privilege of considering expert status a discomfort. So I've testified around 108 times. I've written roughly one million words in expert witness reports. I counted that last night for you. However, it doesn't count. Like the nice segue in some ways from Mark's talk. Doesn't count for tenure, doesn't count for promotion. In this age of metrics, in our audit culture, to quote Marilyn Strathern, what does it mean to say something doesn't count? Public anthropology, I think if we're going to do it and commit ourselves to it in certain times and in certain places, needs to satisfy three things. And the first really has to be you. It has to be something that feeds your intellectual mind and your intellectual soul and, and does something for you that matters to you. It needs to fit disciplinary standards of excellence and rigor, right? So it needs to be built on solid scholarship. And three, it needs to serve the community. Uh, it needs to be of use. It needs to be of service right, to, to that community. One of the things I think we need to do in the academy is learn to say yes. Um, women, especially female faculty, we, we talk a lot about how to learn to say no, and, and don't get me wrong, that's important. But we also need to learn what are the things that we should say yes to, right? The things that actually might, maybe we weren't planning on doing, but, but that are important. So one of the things I've used my, my access to the Savage, soon to be named, renamed Savage Minds uh, Anthropology blog for is to bring in other voices, not just mine, but when, when something is going on that I feel anthropologists should be involved in that conversation to reach out to, to folks. And so when the Ferguson decision came down, um, I came up immediately with a, a list of names who I thought maybe could speak to this, and I reached out to my colleague Bianca and said, Bianca, who do you think would be a good person to speak to this? And Bianca sent me some names. It was, uh, this was happening on a Wednesday morning, the day before Thanksgiving. So most universities were already closed, people were on airplanes, I got an email back from Lynn Bowles saying I'm baking a pie, and I'd said, I'd written to her probably at 9 a.m. saying I need this by 2 p.m. Right? And she's like, I'm baking a pie, I'll see what I can do. Bianca suggested I write to Lee Baker. Lee wrote back saying, kind of this, right? It's the day before Thanksgiving, my kids are home. Um, I wish I could help you, but I'm, I'm, I just can't. Right. Two hours later, what do I find in my box? A beautifully crafted passage from Lee. Sorry, that's here. So Ferguson anthropologists speak out. The contributors were Lee, Whitney Battle Baptiste, Lynn Bowles, Augustin Fuentes, and Alvaro Jarin. So there were a number of anthropologists who simply because of the, the day that it was and the time he couldn't do it, but a number who stopped what they were doing or who worked it into their pie baking or hanging out with their kids. Mm -hmm. And this is, that, this is it, right? What do we say yes to? And maybe what do we say no to so that we can get to those yeses? Maybe it's time to make public anthropology count. This past summer, AAA president Elise Waterston formed a president's committee, a working committee on counting public anthropology and new forms of writing in anthropology. She invited both myself and Bianca Williams to be on the committee. So it's Elise Kate Clancy, who's a biological anthropologist at the University of Illinois, and the two of us. So stay tuned for some directives from the AAA soon on how we might actually, as a discipline, count non-peer-reviewed online and other forms of public scholarship at times of tenure and promotion. Kaesong is now a citizen of Canada but she still considers herself a Tibetan refugee. One day as we lock, walk along the shore of Lake Ontario, she says to me, I've been a refugee twice, first in Nepal and now in Canada. Maybe the third time will be in Tibet. Maybe I'll go home to Tibet as a refugee. Kaesong has been a refugee for almost 40 years, ever since escaping from Tibet as a teenager. 
She thinks it's better to be a refugee in Canada than in Nepal. In Canada, she tells me, refugees receive help with jobs, with language training, and get health care. In Nepal, they get nothing. One morning as she finished her, making her offerings at the family temple, she turned to me and laughed, saying, I pray for the Canadian government every morning. I pray for the deities to protect them well. We sometimes deny it, but we can trace genealogies um, of anthropology as political intervention going all the way back to the mid-19th century. You know, if we really think about what anthropologists were trying to do with the concept of, of evolution, it was to make an intervention in society, to change the way that we thought about human beings. Boaz did the same in the early 20th century with the idea of the ethnographic present, which was then trying to combat what needed to be done um, with problems in evolution. In the 1980s, we throw out the ethnographic present and we come to um, multiple theories working together to bring us to a new part of thinking about a shared historical present. Uh, and Johann Fabian's notion of coevalness, right, of really, right, that we're not in suspended historical time, but shared historical time in the here and now. It's good to remember, nonetheless, that a radical intervention in an earlier era might no longer seem radical in the moment, right? including our own. And for those of us who have been around for several decades, you know, I sometimes cringe at things I even remember saying or writing you know, just 20 years ago. New York Digi Pribatso Tutsumindu. Konsa Leka Mambo Che. Nangso Tranta La Leka Che. You know, Tutsa Yang Yu. Di Yashure. So coming off of Mark's talk also, I think it's important, um, I was fascinated by this, how I have come to think of social media as not just a space for communication, but as an ethnographic space. And what I mean by that is that it has come to be, at least for me in the communities um, in which I share with online, so including the Tibetan activist community, a space where people coexist, where they create community, where they participate and observe and go through those rhythms of daily life together, just the same way that we might do in the field, right? When we're sharing just the, mun, uh, the mundane, the banal things of everyday life. So I think of this actually as a new coevalness. What we end up seeing is a shared engagement in not just what is happening with us in the minutiae of our everyday life, but what is happening politically around the world. So we start seeing things like these, right? This is a message sent from Palestine to Ferguson. Tibetan monks at Ferguson, right? Hands up, don't shoot. We see the Women's March in Paris and in Barcelona. We've also seen in the discipline the rise of something called the anthropology of Trump. It happened during the election, during the campaign season. We had even peer-reviewed scholarship prior to the election. Um, an article by Kira Hall, Donna Goldstein, and Matthew Ingram in How, and a piece by Michael Silverstein and Michael Lempert. All right, so we had, um, in addition to multiple online things. This past week, there has been a little mini explosion in terms of what is going on. Um, so we have the rise of Trumpism, which came out, I believe, on either election day or the day right before. Uh, most recently this week, an interview with Daryl Lee, fantastic if you haven't read it. Alex Golub, this is the one that Ralph mentioned. Archaeology and alternative facts. And we even have the AAA issuing a statement kind of condemning the executive order, the immigrant and Muslim ban. And for the first time, actually, since joining the AAA, the American Ethnological Society issued its own statement in addition to the AAA statement. Then the inaugural, so I was kind of ready to come give my talk for you all. I knew what I wanted to say. And then the inauguration happened. A demagogue advised by a white supremacist became our president. I needed to change my talk. I had to change the content. I have played with the structure. And I have a new title, actually. Today's the 16th day. Lots of stuff has happened. In terms of the scientific world, um, communities of scientists, communities, our colleagues on university campuses, but also at um, governmental science institutions around the country, and actually many of them are in Boulder, you know, where I live. NOAA is there, NIST, like lots of big scientific organizations are headquartered in Boulder. 
folks working on climate change have not only been told you cannot no longer be active on social media, but you cannot freely and publicly share your research data. Just this morning, I read that the EPA was literally erasing, eliminating, deleting all research conducted during the Obama era. They have gone rogue. We haven't talked seriously about what it would mean for anthropology to have to go rogue. We are also, some of us, um, scientists of climate change. And scientists of climate change scientists, right? As anthropologists are wont to do. What happens when we can no longer traffic in facts, when we don't have funding, right? NEH has been funded, NSF potentially next, right? What happens when tenure goes? We have a little more you know, from Mark. Um, and if anyone here is from Wisconsin or has been paying attention, there are already calls in Wisconsin for the University of Wisconsin. Uh, anthropology for some already doesn't count, Governor Rick Scott of Florida. We do research on evolution. We work with Muslim communities. We are scholars of immigrants. We work with refugees. Some of us are refugees. Some of us are Muslim. What would we do if we had to go rogue? Public anthropology means to be engaged, right? Means to communicate our knowledge so that it is useful. I think a rogue anthropology means to be enraged and to communicate our knowledge to disrupt, to stop, to resist, to refuse. That's a whole different use. What do we do? <laughs> All right, so we, I feel right now, I'm thinking back to, you know, like the last five years in anthropology, we are, we're beyond debates of, over the suffering subject. We are actually not even in dark anthropology anymore, and I think that term was just introduced last year. We're in a moment of fascism, right? In a moment of authoritarianism. This is from the website Scientists Against Fascism. <laughs> Prior, maybe we could have discussed that as something from an earlier period in another country. You know, this website was just put up, actually, just in the, very recently. <laughs> we need to learn from existing scholarship, right? Scholarship of fascist states, of authoritarian states you know, where, where top-down power is heavy right, and unrelenting. We need to learn what worked. We need to learn what dissent looked like, what governmentality looked like, with or without Foucault, I don't care, that's up to you, right, but what it looks like. We need to rethink all of this, again, what worked and what didn't work for our here and our now. We need to think hard about questions of ethics and morality, just as the discipline did in Vietnam. And for those of you not in anthropology, but in other disciplines, the same to you. Right? I can only speak from my own discipline's genealogy. We need to write back against the misuse and the abuse of your research, right? the way that our knowledge can be used against um, you know, the, the intent, the spirit, against the people for whom it was written. This is actually not something new to me as a scholar of Tibet, and in my book, that, that Ralph mentioned, actually the end of the introduction, I had to include a section that's called how not to read this book and to make very clear what my politics were such that my engaged critique of the exile community and of the Dalai Lama was not misread as a critique, as a negative critique of him, but as, you know, in the spirit of engagement in which it was meant. Educate yourself. Think about the voices in which you need to write, the genres, the spaces. Think collectively about what we do now. What new interruptions can we imagine? Organize, strike, take the lead on something, but don't take it on everything, <laughs> you know? Let other people do good work and join in when you can and lead where you feel, you know, you can be effective. Assemble your publics. Find your trusted colleagues. Seek new allies, right, and new advocates. I spent the month from December 17th to roughly January, I don't know, 13th, immersed in reading about Trump's lies. It's already a dark month, right, shortest days of the year, and this is what I had to read. I was writing an article, there's going to be a special forum in the May issue of American Ethnologist, and I was asked to contribute to it, and I thought, what can I write on? 
I have an article that came out in 2005 called Truth, Fear, and Lies. It's about Tibet, but I thought, my God, I could use the exact same title. Truth, Fear, and Lies. So I didn't use that title. The title is called An Anthropology of Lying, Trump and the Political Sociality of Moral Outrage. I'm hoping they release it on early view. It's probably already going to be out of date by the time, but because it's peer reviewed, we can't put it out now. Spending a month immersed in reading about not just lies, but also truthful hyperbole, which is the phrase that his biographer coined to refer to the fact that Trump tells lies but doesn't care, um, or alternative facts, which you all are already familiar with, um, <clears throat> was not heartening. And in fact, I came out of that month much more frightened than I went in. The truth is we are not post-truth any more than we are post-racial. With Donald Trump, we are beyond truth and false. We are beyond lying. We are beyond fact-checking. It's not about correcting lies. Yeah, sorry. Enjoy. It's not about correcting lies, but asking, right, in some ways, what is, this, what is the work of the lie, right? What does lying accomplish? And here's where I do want to emphasize sociality, right, that coming together, that the sort of lies that he's telling, there are, and many of them, not all of them, throughout the campaign, but even now, are aspirational. They're the sort you might use on like an online dating profile where you sort of fudge your height or your weight, right? They're things you wish were true. And these aspirational lies become affiliative truths. They're truths that people sign on to. They're truths that build community, right? They're things that people want to be true. Hannah Arendt has written about the modern political lie, and she wrote about this during the Vietnam War with the release of the Ellsberg Papers. What she says is that the modern political lie erases history and creates a new truth in its place. In this political moment, the given that, and given that we are seeing that like unfold before our very eyes, not somewhere else, but here, I think what we need to do is an anthropology not so much as a history of the present, but anthropology as a history of, of the future. And to think about, again, this idea of, of felt truths, right? Or things that you want to be true and you want them to be so true so bad that you decide they are. Last spring, Kisung and I were hanging out one morning at her house. She pulled out her iPad. Wanted to check in, she was going to show me WeChat and check in and see who maybe from Tibet had sent her a message. So we're checking in with her family members and kind of Payal Chik by me from uh, Markham, which is her village in Tibet. And we listened to the messages that had come in overnight. We listened to their voices. And it's the sort of messages that you would send back and forth. How are you? We are fine. How is so-and-so? And so on. You know, just, again, those mundane exchanges that sustain, right, familial kinship and friend relationships. We watch videos of dances and songs Tibetans love to send back, you know, the, the dance from their local area or this song. But then we start seeing a different sort of, of message and video. With horror, we realize we're watching the execution of a Tibetan man in Lhasa, Tibet's capital, in a series of videos, and his crying widow and children and people organizing money for them. We're looking at each other, and I said, well, let me look up online, let me see what happened, right? Like ever the anthropologist and the researcher, I will Google this. I scour the internet for information about the killing, which we just saw happen with our own eyes. I find nothing. Anthropology will not save the world. A good friend of mine, she is a professor of anthropology in Quebec. The Quebec City mosque killer was a student in her introduction to cultural anthropology lecture. Our fight is a big one. We're fighting against hate, against racism, and against white supremacy. We, professors, graduate students, scholars, are already targets. But we can't stop and we shouldn't stop doing what we do, doing it well, doing it fiercely, doing it together. And actually, I think we can only do this together. Thank you. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.